democracy had produced a great victory that we were all hoping for peacefully. Well, maybe not so peacefully, because Yeltsin, you know, to be honest, was really good about cheering for democracy when everybody was voting with him. He was less fond of democracy when the Congress within the new Russian system decided that they did not want to allow him to do the things that he as president thought he should be allowed to do. So in Russia at the time, when you have an executive arguing with the congressional branch, you don't shut down the government till you work it out. You pull out the tanks. Yeltsin has control of the army. The figure is if I put a few holes in the Congress of the, of the Russian people, uh, perhaps those congressmen will come to heel, and they do. Demonstrating at the end of the day, I think, to Russians going forward, that power, force, is ultimately what's going to be really important, even in their new democratic system. That power and force is demonstrated multi-times to the Russians after the Cold War, when NATO, that thing which had been pointed against them, that thing which they had allowed to accept West, East Germany as really an a olive branch for the West, that thing kept expanding closer and closer and closer and closer to their soil. Violating, within Russian sensibilities, a central premise, a central promise, I should say, that American policymakers had given Gorbachev in 1990, when James Baker went to Moscow and said to Gorbachev, NATO will not move one inch to the east. And yet, you can see it did. Now, interesting thing about that conversation. James Baker will tell you to this day, well, yeah, I said it, but that's misunderstood. And Gorbachev will tell you to this day, we would not have gone along with the Americans unless we had that promise. To which Baker will then retort in this wonderful, long-standing fictional conversation, well, show me the document. And Gorbachev will say, oh, I forgot I was dealing with a lawyer. <laughs> Baker's a great lawyer. And he knew that if you didn't write it down and didn't put it in treaty and you didn't publicize it, it didn't exist. And so, yes, in February of 1990, he did tell Gorbachev, NATO will not expand one inch to the east, and there's nothing that he or anyone could do to make subsequent administrations believe that pledge and follow that pledge. President Clinton, who comes into power, President George W. Bush, who comes into power afterwards, they're not beholden to a verbal promise that the Secretary of State made in a moment of crisis, in a moment of tension. Show me the document. They can do what they think is right, which is to keep the evolution and the expansion of democracy moving continuously to the East, as Francis Fukuyama told us it naturally would. Now, we're getting to the really fun part. What happens to... GDP of the Soviet Union, well, I already told you it was bad before, it gets really bad. The 1990s are when it bottoms out. Under Yeltsin, there is no more food, don't bother waiting in line for it. There is no more toilet paper, don't bother waiting in line for it. Unless you have a tremendous amount of money, which is to say, unless you are from the West. So Yeltsin, Gelbertshoff's idea that we would join the West and things would get better, began to appear to the Russian people that we joined the West and the only people who seem to be profiting from that are the West. We, the Russian people, seem to be sinking further and further and further into poverty. And we seem to have something that we never really had before in the first couple of years, of last couple of years of the 1990s and the first couple of years of the 21st century. We have a terrorism problem. We're not only getting poorer, we're getting less secure, the average Russian citizen believes, because we didn't used to have those kinds of problems before. All of which is tremendous fodder for this man. In the center, our good friend to be, Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin was in East Germany when the Berlin Wall came down in 1989. You know that he was a CIA colonel. That's probably the thing that most people like to put in front of his name. Former CIA, or excuse me, not CIA. Wouldn't that have been awesome? I mean, that, talk about, man, I could sell so many books without argument. Former KGB colonel, Vladimir Putin, was in East Germany trying to turn traitors to give secrets from their country to us, trying to solicit out spies, if you will. 
And he is there and watches the chaos that ensues, to his mind, after the East German government refuses to use force to put down the disruptive democratic elements that ultimately consume and take over their state and storm the Berlin Wall. Why, Vladimir Putin argues, didn't they understand what the Chinese had understood, which is a little bit of force at the right time goes a long, long way. Why had they allowed their society to crumble in this way? And in fact, let's go back to this for a moment. He had a, sing a really fascinating experience, that is Putin, when he's in East Germany at this time, because every single KGB safe house and every single East German police center were ransacked and burned by mobs after the wall fell. The East German people always knew where they were, and now that they finally could express their anger, they did. Now, I should say, every single one except for one, Vladimir Putin's. He was in Dresden, and just like in all the other places around the country, the crowd began to gather. Being a German crowd, they had torches and pitchforks. And they said, we're going to burn the place down. Putin orders his men to the back of the house, says, lock the doors and call for help. I got this. Goes to the front of the house, opens the door, looks at the crowd wearing just a sidearm, and says, leave. There are several hundred people in the crowd. There's one guy telling them to go away. The crowd looked into his eyes and did not like their odds. And they left. Only case in which that happens. At which point, Putin realizes they're going to be back. Closes the door, makes a point of locking it, goes back to his men and says, all right, I bought us some time. When are the reinforcements arriving? To which he's told, they're not. The phrase he's told becomes one that was really central in his mind afterwards is, Moscow is silent. Nobody in Moscow was willing to make a decision to save the very soldiers that they had sent out to help the Soviet people. Nobody in Moscow, now that they've become democratic, was strong enough to make a real decision. Therefore, when Vladimir Putin works his way into the Russian system, and works his way up the Russian food command, uh, uh, chain of command, food chain, uh, until ultimately he becomes prime minister and under uh, Yeltsin, and then Yeltsin's successor, we see, curiously enough, that the Soviet, excuse me, now Russian economy begins to do better. It begins to do better under Vladimir Putin. Why does it begin to do better? Well, I think most economists would tell you that the transition from communism to capitalism was always going to be tough, but it wasn't going to be permanent. We all know that there are ups and downs in the capitalistic system. There are recessions and times of boom. And after 10 years of terrible times and recession, it was time for the economy to start moving up again, coincidentally, just at the moment that he takes power. And he argues to the Russian people, time and again, that the reason that they are having the new prosperity, the reason that they are doing better is because they finally have a strong leader. A leader who is not interested in the difficult problems of legislative discussion. A leader who can get things done. And a leader whom the West respects. A leader who has recognized the central character and the central flaw of Gorbachev which is the idea that if you're going to join with Western Europe, you're going to join with people who have not wanted you there for the last 500 years, so get used to it and get tough. Why should we try to join a crowd, a club that wouldn't have us? And a club that even expanded their military sway up into our very border against their very promise? Why should we allow the West, and the Americans in particular, to continue their lying ways. We need someone tough who can stand up to them. And this produces, ultimately, exactly what he wants. By the way, I should also mention, one of the things that he does that really makes his message go over quite well 
is he begins to take control of the state media. How does he take control of the state media? Well, he has a really remarkable luck. I mean, really lucky guy. That every time someone tries to oppose him, either in the media or in the political realm, something happens to them. It's very bizarre. <laughs> 